After I uploaded my last video on YouTube game ads, something strange happened. Well, first, everyone supported the hell out of it, which was really inspiring, and I just wanna say I appreciate it a ton. A million views is nuts, so thank you so much to everyone who watched and supported the video, but that's not the weird thing. The weird thing was YouTube kept advertising games to me. I thought once I called the ads out for being weird and annoying, they would return to whatever wretched place they came from and stop bothering me. But if anything, I now get more ads from YouTube than I did before. Clearly, the nebulous algorithmic forces that govern our digital lives have noticed that I download games from ads and have since marked me as a prime target. At first, playing one of these games was the last thing I wanted to do. But then, slowly but surely, curiosity crept its way back into my head as I started asking the same question that led me down this road in the first place. What are these games like? So, just like last time, I've written down the games YouTube has advertised to me over the course of the last month or so, and I'm going to play and review them all. Now, if you haven't had a chance to check out the first video I made on this subject, I'll quickly recap the ground rules. Nothing scammy, nothing sexy, and I play every game for at least an hour, at which point I'll give a score out of 10. The score is more of a snap reaction than a full review though, since an hour or two is barely enough time to get a first impression for most games, although these ones tend to show their hand pretty quickly. Without further ado, let's take a journey back into the putrid, cavernous world of games from YouTube advertisements. First up on our list we have Evony. Evony? Evony? Evony. From the very start, things with this game were confusing. In the ads, it looks like your standard barrel shooter. You know, it's a genre I'm pretty familiar with after my excruciating hour with Last War Survival in the last video. But as soon as I went to download Evony, the branding on the website looked completely different, seemingly positioning itself as a historical strategy game. So before we go any further, I wanna do a little experiment with you all. I'm gonna show you clips from three games and I want you to tell me which one is Evony. All right, here's number one, and number two, and finally, number three. Pause the video, take as much time as you need. Well, no matter what you guessed, you are simultaneously wrong and right, because all three of these are Evony. The game is essentially made up of three barely functional prototypes stitched together into a Franken game that is somehow worse than each of its parts would be on their own. First, you have the historical base building component, which is the part they put front and center, probably because it's the best looking of the three by far. Now, that's not to say it's an artistic achievement across the board or anything like that. For example, I chose the Japan faction and all the characters had British accents for some reason. The world of Ebony will be ours. Ebony. It's Ebony. Okay. Also, the music is so loud you can barely hear yourself think. Always to flee treason. The Tang Dynasty wakes up in the morning bell. Ting This problem is further exacerbated by the fact that they don't allow you to use the settings menu until you finish the tutorial. Okay, there's gotta be some settings in here. You got some settings in here so I can turn this shit down? Please, L? Does that do anything? Nope. But still, whoever did the visual piece here did a good job. I can't say anything nice about the gameplay, however, and I'll illustrate my point with a quick story. When I was growing up, there was this other family we used to hang out with a lot, and the dad was a real jokester. Whenever he asked the kids to do chores, he would assign an arbitrary point value to them. So it was like, if you wash the car, that's worth 100 points. And the kids would do it, and they'd ask him what they could get for their points, at which point he'd say, well, when you get 1,000 points, you can trade those in for one mega point. And then they'd get 1,000 mega points, and those would turn into gold stars, and then 1,000 gold stars would become a smiley face, and so on and so forth. That is a perfect analogy for Evany's gameplay. Upgrades only seem to help the player in that they allow them to get access to future upgrades. 
None of it seems to matter in any way, and this part of the game pretty quickly devolved into a mindless clicking simulator. But of course, we still have the other two components of Ebony to talk about, like the mysterious puzzle. That's literally what they call it in the game too. No narrative justification, no nothing. It's just the mysterious puzzle, which is a 2D puzzle game with a completely different theme and art style compared to Evany's base building. While graphically it would barely pass for a Prince of Persia fan game, there is at least some amount of game design going on with some of the puzzles, which puts it above the rest of the game most of the time. Third, we have the Overworld, which allows you to raid other players and fight monsters like the Sphinx and the iconic video game enemy, the Hypocritical Knight. That's right, in this historical civilization game where Abraham Lincoln reads the Holy Bible, you can send your troops to fight literal deities. Once again, this piece of Ebony introduces a completely new art style and further widens the schism between the game's elements. But hey, before I logged off forever and never touched this game again, I figured it would be worth trying. You know, maybe this is where all the budget went and the raids would somehow show me some cool animations or something. So I rallied my men and gave them a rousing wartime speech. Sure, our odds of winning are extremely low. Sure, you've never done a raid before. But this kingdom has gone through too much to back down now. We've upgraded our walls. We've defeated the mighty minotaurs lurking in the mysterious puzzle. We've become brothers after grieving the death of my sister in a random side quest for some reason. And today, we will defeat the level seven boss Yasha and become immortal. So who's with me? Charge! Uh, at this rate, they'll be there in a fortnight. Where is he? Oh my god. Oh my god. What? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus, what? We're not even there yet. I'm gonna get carpal tunnel from scrolling. What the fuck? They're gonna be there in three weeks. <laughs> oh, there he is. You got that, guys? You got that? You ready to get there? Almost there. There, there they are. Led by, uh... What is it? Let's scout. Upgrade. Uh, of course. Whew, speed up. Nope, gotta spend... Uh, Alright, well... After spending a recall crystal, I did manage to get my guys to a much closer boss fight, and let me say, the fighting animations exceeded my expectations and more. But there's one other element of Ebony I haven't considered yet, which is, of course, the microtransactions. Whatever positives you could possibly give Ebony, they are completely erased by the most desperate and brazen monetization I have ever seen. This game feels like it was designed by the same people who designed Vegas slot machines. At any given moment, there are no fewer than five UI elements on screen designed to get you to spend money. But I will say, they really do try to get you the best bang for your buck with some amazing deals. No, 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 come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You can get me with the Maria Teresa whatever super legendary five million gems. You cannot tell me that you were planning on selling me something for $100 that is now 99 cents. You can't do that. You can't do that because I know it's not true. The super value package is here one time offer only. 200 extra 80,000% return. <laughs> oh my god. Overall, Ebony is a horrible waste of ones and zeros that duct tapes completely unfinished concepts together to provide an experience that truly has nothing going for it besides barely passable puzzle design and art. But hey, at least Spartacus is almost to my kingdom. 1.5 out of 10.
Oh man, I cannot tell you guys how happy I was to move on from Ebony. I couldn't wait to dive into whatever was next, because honestly, anything other than Ebony was going to be better. So as soon as I got the ad for our next game, Total Battle, I tried to immerse myself in the experience, starting with the game's website, which was already hitting me with some impressive marketing. From the quality of the writing alone, I knew I was in for something special. The sense of beauty was growing inside, the first creatures Ifrit and Overlord seemed harsh and ugly, they decided to create other life forms which would be more sophisticated and complicated they. Period. Ifrit and Overlord were worried about this bestiary never seen before in strategy games with no downloads. Now listen, I could understand if you're not convinced by that. Studios use flowery language to hype up their titles all the time. But not to worry, because Total Battle had the most powerful marketing of all. Word of mouth. Oh, let's check out some reviews. I love this game. Fun and fight! <laughs> He looks like a distinguished gentleman as well. Look at him. Who else? <laughs> okay. Uh, good game. And there is Polish. Yes. I'm playing in translation in Portuguese. Congratulations for the beautiful game. With those glowing reviews sitting comfortably in the back of my mind, I jumped into Total Battle with newfound enthusiasm. Finally, I was free of Ebony's chains and could drink in a new experience. Immediately, Total Battle made a strong first impression with its gameplay via an all-new, ultra-fresh take on the barrel shooter genre. See. Instead of the upgrades coming at you, you go to them. It's absolutely revolutionary stuff. As the mighty demon fell to the ground before me at the end of the first battle sequence, I could not wait to see what was next in total battle. Oh my god. No. Guys, I can't. I can't do more of this. It's Ebony. It's just Ebony again. It's the same game. Holy shit. The gameplay, the art style, everything. It's all the same. I don't know how it's possible, frankly, because I feel like there should be a lawsuit happening or maybe worse, these two studios are in cahoots with each other somehow. I don't know. In fact, these games are so similar that earlier when I said my sister died in a random side quest, that clip was actually from Total Battle, and I didn't even realize it until after I wrote the script for this video. There's really not much to say here because you essentially just saw my review for this game, but in general I think Total Battle executes the Ebony formula slightly better. If you told me it was Ebony Remastered, I would absolutely believe you. The UI is just a little cleaner, the progression is just a little snappier and less focused on upgrading walls, and the raids are more clearly explained in the tutorial. The settings menu is also immediately accessible out of the box, which I can't believe I'm even discussing as a positive thing a game can do. The mysterious puzzle, unfortunately, is no more and has been replaced by the math game. I, I mean, a super cool battle simulator. But beyond that, the rest is the same. Even with these minor improvements in mind, shinier garbage is still garbage. Two out of 10. It was at about this point in my recording that the parallels with the last video started to become eerie. I had played two horrendous games in a row, which isn't shocking considering who I'm taking my recommendations from, but just like last time, my third game came in the form of a fantasy RPG with seemingly higher production values. Before, it was Dragonair Silent Gods, and this time, it's Watcher of Realms. Like Dragonair, Watcher of Realms tries to sell itself more like a legitimate title compared to most mobile games. There's even an IGN article about it. I mean, granted, it was a very vague one with promotional screenshots and no gameplay, but it's an article nonetheless. From the advertising alone, it was pretty hard to tell exactly what Watcher of Realms was, though. Like the IGN article, everything had an artificial feel to it, and the most substantial info in the advertisement is that the game is a next-gen fantasy RPG, which is about as specific as calling a dish at a restaurant food. So what exactly is it? Well, it's not Ebony, thank god, and it's also not next-gen, nor is it an RPG. Watcher of Realms is a hero-based tower defense game, plain and simple. 
While that premise isn't necessarily bad on its own, I think Watcher of Realms is still lacking in the execution department. There are things you can do to make a tower defense game engaging throughout, and Watcher of Realms simply doesn't do any of them. I was playing browser tower defenses in middle school that blow this game out of the water mechanically. For example, in Bloon's Tower Defense, or my personal favorite, Kingdom Rush, does anyone remember that game? I feel like that game was really good and it did not get the credit it deserved, but anyway. In those games, you upgrade your units throughout each battle, always starting from level 1. The higher skill tree options are designed to excel against different enemy types, so it was up to the player to make strategic decisions on the fly to complete the levels. In Kingdom Rush, there were also optional side objectives you can engage with, which forced you to divert resources away from the main fight, giving you even more to think about mid-game. In order to keep the gacha game DNA of Watcher of Realms intact, they don't let you do any of that, instead forcing you to upgrade heroes between levels. This means once you put your heroes down, there's really nothing for you to do but watch her of realms. Oh brother, this guy stinks! It's a shame though, because there are elements of the game that are well done in my opinion. In terms of presentation, it's not going to be winning any awards or anything, but it gets the job done, except for the voice acting, which is definitely a notch below getting the job done. Whoa. Oh my god, what kind of voice acting was that? I also appreciate that there's no tedious exploration or endless stats to sort through. For the most part, Watcher of Realms gets you in and out of the action as quickly as a game like this should. Still, the positives can't make up for the fact that this game falls into a pretty predictable cycle that was already losing its shine after just two hours. You do missions, summon heroes, level them up so you can say some crazy shit on the message boards, and repeat. I think the game would automatically be 20% better if they gave you anything to do mid-battle, but unfortunately they don't. I'd be lying if I said I had no fun at all, but I also felt no desire to play for any reason other than making this video. 4.5 out of 10. At this point, I'd played 9 games from YouTube ads, counting the ones from the last video, and it started to feel like I was just playing different combinations of the same few mechanics and ideas. For whatever reason, things like rolling for heroes, base building, auto battles, and completely unhinged global chat seem to be recurring themes, and with this in mind, I was definitely in the mood for something different. To my surprise and relief, that's exactly what I got. The next ad I received was for a game called Hydraneer, which had all the makings of a real video game. Not only did it show actual gameplay in the trailer, but the Steam page is a glowing example of success complete with overwhelmingly positive reviews and evident community support. But there was something about Hydraneer that wasn't sitting right with me. From the title alone, it's clear that it's an engineering game that's catered towards people with scientific, pragmatic minds. Which is to say, um, not me. There are just certain game genres that don't click with me, and generally games that encourage players to make their own fun without providing clear direction or curated action fall into that category, even when that concept is executed as well as it can be. But not all hope was lost, because on the flip side, there are games that are so unquestionably great that they transcend my preconceived notions and captivate me anyway. For example, Into the Breach made me appreciate turn-based strategy. Hades showed me how the weaknesses of the roguelike formula could be turned into strengths, and Shovel Knight King of Cards and Inscription got me excited about card-based gameplay. So, would Hydraneer be the game that makes me love engineering sandboxes? Uh, it pains me to say this, but no. Not even a little bit. And the reason it pains me to say that is because Hydraneer is clearly a labor of love in the way the other games I have played on these videos aren't. This isn't some studio trying to exploit my bad habits to make a quick buck, as evidenced by the fact that there wasn't a single microtransaction or time saver to be found anywhere in Hydraneer. Even from just playing the tutorial, it was clear that the developers had put a lot of thought into how Hydraneer's many systems interact with one another, especially when it comes to setting up your machinery. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In broad strokes, Hydraneer is a game about optimizing the supply chain of a mining operation to get as rich as possible. This is achieved through a simple core game loop of gathering resources, selling said resources, then using your new cash to buy better equipment that will in turn yield more resources. 
For those who love this game, there is clearly a lot of fun to be had throughout that loop. But for me, it just felt like work, especially when you consider the less acceptable elements of the game. There is just a feeling of jank that pervades every moment of Hydraneer. Most frustratingly, you can't just pick up and drop items by looking at them like you do in every other game. You have to line up this weird reticle on the ground with the desired item to interact with it, which gets real annoying real quick considering pretty much the only way you can interact with the world is by picking up and dropping stuff. This even applies when you are buying new equipment, where instead of just pulling up a menu and buying what you want, you have to pick up and drop each individual item you want onto the purchased platform, then drop your money, which exists as physical coins for some reason, into the purchase bucket, then hit the purchase button. Most interactions in Hydraneer are this obtuse, making for an experience that was very hard to enjoy, despite the fact that I wanted to. Huh? Why? Huh? Huh? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, I don't understand what's wrong, but apparently something's wrong. Uh, 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 uh. Let's go. Dude, I'm gonna lose my fucking mind! But even after a pretty unsatisfying first hour, there was light at the end of the tunnel. The Steam reviews praising the game mentioned that the first hour of the game is a tedious grind because you are mining by hand, but that after you buy your first couple of machines, things really open up and get better. So I decided to press on and download a quick update and oh my god, the game is unplayable. I really don't know what happened here, but whatever secret sauce they added with that update just destroyed my computer. After a couple hours of troubleshooting, I decided it was tolerable enough to fight through the frame drops to see if I could get my mining operation going at least a little bit. So I put my head down and decided to grind away, following the tutorial to the letter. I bought the furnace, the cauldron, the anvil, the hamler, the hamler? <laughs> a useless hand sorter, and the grinding wheel, ready to cash in my biggest haul ever. I overcame the jank, and after another hour or so, I had two golden swords and one made of an even rarer material called Cloudium, which I'm sure is the most valuable thing in the universe and people should do anything to get it regardless of the consequences. I made my way to the jeweler to deposit what would surely be my biggest haul ever in the hopes that I would get the $1,000 I needed to buy my first refinery and conveyor belts. Maybe. Got the Cloudium going. Let's see. The shinier it is, the more I'll pay for it. Uh, four out of ten. In the last video, I said I was prompted to make it because of the ads I got for Hero Wars. Obviously, there's no game on Earth that could replicate Hero Wars ads in terms of content, but there is one that rivals it in terms of sheer quantity of ads they put out. That game is none other than AFK Journey, and my god do the ads drive me nuts, and they are absolutely everywhere. I feel like I can't open my fridge without seeing this pink haired goober trying to sell me on this easy development game, whatever that means. I also hate this trend we're starting to see in advertising where people pretend to be influencers, as if that will trick my brain into thinking I'm getting a recommendation from a cool, relatable online personality, rather rather than someone being paid to promote something. While we're on the subject, I also want to share what I've learned recently about how these ads are actually made. As it turns out, lots of these companies do something interesting and in my opinion morally questionable here. As I understand it, the creation of these ads, especially on apps like TikTok, is framed as a contest oftentimes, where anyone can enter a submission for a chance at a cash prize, usually around a few grand. On its face, it sounds kind of cool in that anyone could theoretically make an ad that millions of people will see from their bedroom and make some cash while doing it. But it also means that these companies are able to crowdsource a massive body of work from the public while avoiding paying for 99% of it, allowing them to save tens of thousands of dollars. I thought that was an interesting tidbit and I'm curious to hear what you all think about this practice. Anyway, back to AFK Journey. 
In contrast to Hydroneer, which was a game I wanted to like but couldn't bring myself to, AFK Journey was a game I wanted to hate because of their obnoxious ads, but ultimately ended up enjoying, despite the fact that it checks pretty much all of the boxes we've seen from previous games. Rolling for Heroes? Check. Auto Battles? Check. Completely unhinged global chat? Check. But I have to say, AFK Journey combines and executes these elements better than any game I've played to this point. The production value is pretty high generally, especially from a visual standpoint. The UI is clean and easy to navigate, the character designs are interesting and well done, and the overall visual style is easy on the eyes. Similarly, the game manages to be a cut above its contemporaries in the gameplay department by making some welcome improvements to the auto battle system. While I will always prefer games that put me in the center of the action, which is something I'll talk about more in a little bit, AFK Journey adds things like interactables, different terrain, and multiple character abilities to keep you engaged as your team fights. Through the Dream Realm, they also allow you to fight endgame level creatures much earlier than other similar games do, giving you rewards based on the damage you deal to it rather than only if you beat it. In the cases of Hero Wars, Dragonair, and Watcher of Realms, I heard time and again how the strategic depth of the game comes in when you are in the endgame and need specific team compositions to beat the ultra-challenging fights, so I appreciated how AFK Journey gave me a taste of that up front. Otherwise, I would have said the game was painfully easy, which was certainly true of the main story content I did considering I had a team of nearly all legendary heroes after just two hours. This is another key difference I noticed with AFK Journey. In Watcher of Realms, I got just two summons in roughly two hours of play. In the same amount of time in AFK Journey, I got, and I'm not exaggerating, no fewer than 75 summons, several of which were legendary heroes. Although getting legendary heroes so quickly and frequently felt good initially, it did give me some concerns about the game's long-term progression. Generally, if legendary gear drops too frequently, that can damage a game's economy and rob players of the exhilaration that comes with seeing that fabled orange beam. Looking at you, Borderlands 3. So I'd imagine the same would be true for AFK Journey, but I didn't put enough time in to find out. The other element of AFK Journey that hurts it, in my opinion, is the AFK system itself. For those who don't know, AFK stands for Away From Keyboard, which is a reference to AFK Journey's idle mechanic. Essentially, the game is always running in the background even if you have it closed, and the longer you go without playing, the more rewards you accumulate. This gives players the feeling that they are progressing even when they don't have time to play, in addition to giving them a reason to look forward to logging on again. While it's not my cup of tea, it really does seem to work for some people, hence the success of Journey's predecessor, AFK Arena. But AFK Journey adds a problematic wrinkle. Some story missions are gated behind certain AFK levels, meaning you have two options if you are under that level. The first is to grind AFK levels manually, which is repetitive and tedious, and the second is to just stop playing the game you were previously enjoying. I read a lengthy review on the game's subreddit from a frustrated player who had dozens of hours on the game, and this was their chief complaint, specifically mentioning that later in the game these gates are placed more and more frequently. Even I ran into it in my short time with the game, and its negative effects were felt immediately. Whoa, level 28, Hippofiend. Wait, what? Why can't I fight him? Oh, I have to do AFK stages to get to the next thing? Wow, that is kind of a shame, actually. To be clear, while AFK Journey is the best iteration of this game concept I've seen, that certainly doesn't mean I consider it a masterpiece. If you're a fan of idle games, I think it's well done, but for me personally, there's a ceiling on how much I can enjoy that sort of thing. For me, gameplay is king, and it's not just about the action on screen, it's about how I directly contribute to it as a player. AFK Journey exemplifies my feelings about its combat perfectly by putting my character on screen during battles, just to have him sit in the back doing nothing besides occasionally casting an automated spell, watching as my heroes do the cool stuff rather than me. I don't want to watch another character execute a sweet sword combo to finish off a strong enemy, that's what I want to be doing. 
For this reason and the others I listed, I found my experience with AFK Journey to be decent, but nothing special. Still, it is the high watermark for this batch of games, which isn't shocking considering the stiff competition it was up against. 5.5 out of 10. Well, that about does it for part two of playing every game YouTube advertises to me. I have yet to find one of these that I would play for more than a couple hours, but who knows, maybe that day will come down the line. If you were an avid player of one of the games I talked about and want to shed some light on what the late game experiences are like for any of them, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. That was certainly one of the most interesting parts of the reception of the last video, and I like engaging with you guys. Have a good one, and thanks for watching.